live broadcast about connecting warming water and wildlife. My name is Ingmar Rensog and I'm the CEO of We Don't Have Time and I will be your host here uh, this broadcast. If you have a question to the speakers, you can uh, ask the questions in the We Don't Have Time app. So go to App Store and Google Play and download We Don't Have Time uh, and just ask your question uh, there. Uh, and uh, we will forward it to the speakers after the presentation. Today's situation in India is acute and over 21 cities is in the risk of losing their groundwater as early as next year. Uh, and therefore I'm really proud to present today's speakers. Uh, Fukan and Tanner from, from UK, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Raj. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. I come from Assam, which is in the easternmost part of India, and it is known as a biodiversity hotspot of the country. I grew up in the middle of civil war-like situations because my country was facing the early impacts of climate change, but we did not know it then. We had an armed uprising, we had a lot of uh, flooding and erosions, and we had the students-led movement that really affected my life. Therefore, it was perhaps inevitable that I would grow up to be a climate reality leader. I trained as a climate reality leader, just like Dr. Guy here and Ingmar, at Istanbul in 2013. And then I went on to be a mentor. And I was also lucky, which was like my greatest honor, to have got some mention in Mr. Al Gore's new book. So I always say that water is the local issue of global climate change for people and for biodiversity. The government of India itself says we are facing the worst ever water crisis in our history. And it is of grave concern that it's going to get worse. Yes, not just 21 cities, but a lot of people are being affected. In fact, 600 million Indians face high to extreme water scarcity right now. 600 million. 50% of India, 54% is already facing acute water crisis. And if you look at these figures, in Tamil Nadu, 95% of the wells supplying water for farmers have dried up. In the state of Gujarat, the water table is falling by about 20 feet per year, which is almost unbelievable. A groundwater crisis that's affected millions around the country with the wetlands shrinking and then the rivers drying up is happening every day. That's the reality of the water crisis in India. And uh, about 40,000 farmers have committed suicide according to official figures in the last four or five years alone. And we suspect that figure is much more than what is coming out. Now, this entire map shows the areas where the water wars are likely to happen. And unfortunately, my region, right here, the Nile Ganges Brahmaputra, which is the river that runs through my home state, is right there. This is where the water wars are likely to happen, unfortunately. Now, India is not just facing a water crisis, but that's worsened by a lot of other factors, like overuse of fresh water, like wastage of water. This is common. If you are traveling around India on a train, most likely this is something that is seen from the window. And then there is water theft. So people are stealing water that they should not be using, and there is high level of toxins. So all that is a challenge for everybody, and that is something that Walk for Water uh, we try to address. So I am the CEO of that company that's based out of Hyderabad, and we set up this community water centers where we have a five process of filtration, and we take any water that is available and then supply it to the poor people at very, very cheap rates. Uh, why we charge them is because if you give something to 
you know, the villages for free, it's misused. So we charge a very minimal uh, 20 paisa. Uh, I'm sure you cannot even break it down into, uh, you know, the krona because it's too little. Then we also started this water ATMs and uh, promoted entrepreneurship by this 99K social enterprise where we invite the villagers to be more responsible by taking water as a business opportunity with an investment of rupees 99,000 and then uh, set up this at the local public stations so that not only are people more aware but also more responsible for the water. Uh, Work for Water also collaborates with various agencies to set up this uh, rooftop rainwater. These are just two systems we do. Uh, and all of that water is really creating a huge challenge because it's changing the, uh, the environment where biodiversity thrives, the, the envelope where animals live, different species thrive, is slowly changing. For example, the vegetation in many parts of India have changed over the last few years. In my own place in Assam, the grasslands are replaced by invasive creepers and shrubs, which is affecting the food availability to various species. I'll come to that just a short while later. Uh, all around the world, you must be aware that uh, species are on the move. In the marine systems, we have seen that all the animals from uh, small microorganisms like the planktons to the largest fish like the whale shark are all moving towards the poles. At the same time, on the terrestrial system, small butterflies and birds and all the pikas, they're all seen moving northwards to the poles. They're migrating because the environment is changing. The vegetation that's available for them, that's required for them to survive, is no longer there. Let's come uh, to the tiger. You know, I just told you that the other animals are shifting, but the tiger is a highly terrestrial animal. Suppose the deer does not great get the grass that it requires to survive, they go to another part of the park. But the tiger cannot follow them because there's already another tiger or maybe a leopard living there. And because they are so territorial, there will be a fight until death. So that is a huge factor uh, affecting survival of the tigers. This is a radio colored tiger. Unfortunately, we lost him uh, two years back. We don't know where he went. So, you know, that's the story of tigers in India. This rhino is kind of the symbol for where I live in Assam, in the eastern part of India. And the uh, rhino again survi survives on the grass. And the grasslands are disappearing because we are not getting the rainfall we used to. The floods are coming at the wrong time. And at many places, the grass is replaced by the invasive species. It leads to more conflict to human beings because the rhinos tend to wander out from the protected areas and all that uh, sort of things that is a nightmare for wildlife managers. And the elephant, of course, the largest herbivore we have in our country, in our parts. And they're very, very stressed by increasing temperatures, uh, lack of water, as well as food stress. So these are some of the animals I wanted to show. Um, this man is a very good friend of mine. He's known as the forest man of India, and he's been awarded one of the highest civilian honors in India, Padma Shri. So when I met him about seven years back, he said that reforestation alone could save the world from the consequences of climate change. And he was so true. In the last two years, we have had more and more people, more reports coming out that we need massive reforestation, massive restoration of the green cover of the ecosystems that we are displacing to actually address climate change. And this is what we do. We take a lot of school children and ensure that they plant trees. And some of these you can see are banana plants. And this is because Banana is one of the favorite plants, dishes, for the elephants, and they love the banana. So what our intention is to plant banana w in, the, in the corridors of the elephants. So, you know, when they're coming down to the paddy fields, they get lured by the banana, stop 
there and eat the banana and go back up the hill. So they don't go down to the paddy fields and that way we kind of avoid the conflict. So till now we have planted about 100,000 banana plantations uh, across where I live in Assam. Then we also have to motivate the poor villagers. These are people who live near the forest and they're very, very poor. In the winter, they cannot afford a blanket. In the summer, they cannot afford a mosquito net. And my organization, we work with these communities and we give them uh, blankets and mosquito nets and uh, reading materials uh, f to the students for free to motivate them to improve the wildlife habitat, protect the animals, uh, lure them away from you know, killing any anything they see and eat, eat it, and uh, you know, put some conservation sense into them. So that's some way we are managing our wildlife and water too. Uh, this is what we do in the schools all the time. You know, uh, photographs speak much better than words. So school children are always uh, lured by these photographs. Uh, the Kids for Tigers program is based out of Mumbai, and we conduct it in about uh, 1,000 schools across the country every year. Till now, s since 2001, we have touched about 1 million students in in India, and our program ensures that these students know where the food is coming from, why the water is important, why the forests are important, why it is all connected to climate change and their future. And we try to make sense that, you know, you students, you human beings, all of us are actually part of this ecosystems. When we show them the food wave or the ecosystem, we do not put our photograph in this, right? But we are so vital because Everything is affected by us. Everything depends on us more and more. Excuse me. So we request them to get out, go out into the wild and discover what it is to experience this. This is something nobody in my home state in Assam has seen. Right? This is right in the border with uh, China and nobody is you know, going there at all. So when I show this photograph, uh, to many students during my interactions, they are all of the opinion that it's from some, you know, foreign country, some exotic land, maybe a beach resort in um, Thailand or Mauritius, but actually it's, you know, just back door to us. Oh, this is my wife and daughter. <laughs> this is the Climate Abandon book. This was uh, released on Earth Day uh, this year in the US and I wrote the chapter on biodiversity impacts of climate change. So yeah, I thought just uh, I'll just introduce them to you. Well, so no thought of uh, climate change impacts on wildlife or biodiversity is complete without the polar bears, of course. And I had a great opportunity to see six polar bears just last week up in Svalbard. I was on a expedition with National Geographic scientists and, uh, and, and some legendary explorers. And uh, we saw, we actually reached the sea ice extent at 79.8 degrees north. And the area where we went was this time experiencing more sea ice, uh, contrary to popular expectations, than in the past few years, right? But that's not true for all the Arctic. We are just in one small part of the Spitsbergen Island. But in other parts, the sea ice has really receded. And uh, thankfully, all the ships realize that, that go there, realize that, and they do not attempt to break into the sea ice because that they, that's the last habitat of the polar bear. It was my fortune to see a mother and two cubs, a uh, nursing mother, and uh, I think that's something that I'll carry away from my trip forever. However, it's not just the polar bear that are affected by climate change. There are so many other species. Uh, interestingly, the red fox has migrated into the territory of the Arctic fox. Uh, the Arctic fox is much smaller, of course, and uh, there are reports that the red fox is actually predating on the Arctic fox. And uh, they're competing for the same food sources. So obviously the red fox is winning over the Arctic fox, and which is such a pity because this is such a unique animal. A few years back, I had the fortune to take part in a citizen science project 
and the Canadian Arctic in the Churchill Northern Studies Center, where we looked at how climate change is affecting the tiny tadpole, the frogs. The, there are two species of frogs which actually survive the Arctic freezing. For eight months, they create a bubble and they survive there. And when the ice melts, they're able to come out and then you know continue the life process. So this is the boreal chorus frog. And unfortunately, even in the Arctic, they are losing out. They are losing out all across the world. And we have lost about 50% of all species of amphibians in the last, uh, within this century. And so have the turtles, the sea turtles, which survive uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs are losing out as well. So these are some of the global effects of climate change, which really bothers me. Back in India, one of the things that we really worried about is that nobody talks about our coral reefs. You know, we know about the Great Barrier Reef. We know the Great Barrier Reef is now on the road to recovery. Some of the scientists on board the expedition that I went to are working at the Great Barrier Reef at two uh, locations. One of them is mayor of the towns where the most, uh, the highest impact of, uh, you know, climate change on the Great Barrier Reef are being studied. And he is pretty sure that the Great Barrier Reef is in the process of recovery. So hopefully we will uh, have some uh, good news from there. So the leader of my expedition was uh, Robert Swan, who is actually the first man to have walked to both the poles, and also the first man who walked to the South Pole, surviving three months using only implements that are powered by renewable energy sources. And his contention is that if we can do it in Antarctica, in the worst climate ever, why can't we do it here? And that makes sense, doesn't it? And he generously flagged off the reindeer rising that Dr. Guy and myself represent, and that uh, we are so lucky to be here with you. This was flagged off from Oslo. Uh, two days back, and this is the Salvat reindeer that I could see, and uh, we really are concerned about the impacts of warming on the reindeers. The climate crisis is affecting the reindeer in many ways. Uh, Dr. Guy will be talking more about that. The, of course, the same species is known as the caribou in North America, and uh, yeah. So I will uh, request Dr. Guy to take on from here about the reindeer, and then we'll again discuss when do we have the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Dr. Guy Tane. I'm the managing director of the Green Cow Organization. I developed uh, the concept of uh, the rising rainbow, and if you want to follow what we're doing in general as a networked organization, then look on uh, Facebook and uh, Rising Rainbow Central and all of the stories of all my wonderful colleagues in my network worldwide coming through there. It's not about me, I'm just the uh, communicator here, doing my best. So, uh, a story. Believe me, Raj has really covered most of the bases. And what I wanted to do here, thank you very much, what I wanted to do here was to ensure that we take something out of this little meeting. So five minutes of my time, you'll be pleased to know, okay? Um, and I want to uh, cover my story pr principally around this flag behind me. I have no slides. First of all, I need to thank We Don't Have Time. And I need to thank Greta for the way that your nation and the north of Europe are projecting an understanding of the severity and the seriousness of the great climate change, the global heating that we're currently engaged in. What I want to emphasize today is that we are not the only ones affected, and it's so easy to forget that the other crisis is the environmental, specifically the others, the wildlife that live on this planet with us too, okay? So um, from a background of this, an understanding of the, the relationships, the interactions, the connections between people, between wildlife, and then with this crisis that we find ourselves in. To establish that connection is something that you guys have generated 
uh, over the last six months and few years since particularly I met Raj, 2013, all of that realization has happened. So I was faced with a challenge. How do I generate a project which is relevant, which is exciting, which see people can get behind from Europe? Our contribution as a continent to the other ecosystems or ecozones of the world, and uh, you can see it from human or from uh, environmental point of view, it's the same, okay, thank you. So, um, what I wanted to do was to start with the rainbow, realize that uh, we had something to offer which would change the world. Not me, you. How was I going to do that? Well, I was going to talk nicely to an old friend of us all, the reindeer. The rest of the world commonly think of Rudolf, Rudolf the reindeer, and there's a great association there. First of all, because of the references to tradition, the references to future and to children, the interaction between my generation, I have to say, and uh, the next generation. And so he, first of all, stands as a symbol for what is good and kind and loving about being a human being. But he's also an animal. And he lives on the edge. This is a specialist in living on the edge. The, you, you know this already, but to be able to survive for nine months a year in the dark, in the snow, is an extraordinary thing. To generate new children in three months and to have your children run away from the mosquitoes um, immediately into the wild is an extraordinary thing. And they've been doing that for 6,000 years since the Ice Age and with human beings. We have a symbiotic relationship with these wonderful creatures. So they stand also as a symbol of that relationship between us and wildlife. But this character, he's not sitting on the line here. He's below the line. This is water. This is ice. The guy's in trouble. So here's the other half of the deal. We have to look after the wildlife and this character, who reminds us to be good people, also needs our help. There have been tens of thousands of reindeer and caribou, as they are called in America, die mysteriously over the last three years. They're in decline at the rate of 75% in three years. That is an extinction rate. They're heading towards zero. And we need to do something. We need to wake up the world to realize we have a responsibility. We are the human beings, we are the people who created the problem. Of course we have to solve it for ourselves, but we have to save it for the quality of life of this planet. I want to thank him. But you know, the sun is rising. I know it doesn't drop too far much lower here. So it's rising again and it's rising up here. And what we're going to do is to create an organization, the two of us, called Human Nature Solutions. And if this is nothing else, and I know it's so much more, it's our opportunity to say, join us. You're human. We are human of nature. Nature is part of us. And we, all of us, human beings, community by community, have the solutions. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you. Uh, I, I will start uh, with some question about the situation in India right now, uh, because I, I just saw a satellite image of the sixth largest city where all the lakes is dried out and actually the groundwater is all gone. Uh, so you, you, who is from India, how is how, how do you describe the situation and how is people reacting to all this and uh, what do they do? Well, sadly we just had the general elections where water was not the issue. I showed you all the slides where water crisis has been acknowledged by the government itself. But the political parties during the general elections last month did not have water or the biodiversity crisis on the agenda which is just incredible. But 
It's very real. Unfortunately, I come from a region water is abundant, not in scarce, but across the plateaus of uh, North India and uh, South India, there is huge water resource deficiency. People, farmers are leaving their villages. They're going to the cities. They're now working as laborers. Uh, crops are failing. And uh, fortunately, these are just pockets uh, that is happening now. And although it is not as difficult to manage because we still have little rain, and India is a fertile land, right? We had abundant rainfall. We have, of course, a change in rainfall patterns, but still we have abundant rainfall. But the prob main problem is the groundwater level. The aquifers are losing out. At the same time, industrialization has led to a lot of companies shifting to rural areas, uh, and it is not for just bottled soft drinks, but also for bottled water itself. So villagers are actually selling their water sources to companies. So it's getting worse. And unfortunately, we don't see a solution and something drastic really happens. The government uh, has really set up a water ministry after it came to power, and hopefully that's going to change situations a little bit. And uh, what do you think about next year? Because I read 21 cities is uh, going to be out of groundwater, maybe. Yeah, that is incredible. And uh, fortunately, most of the cities have uh, taken emergency steps, like installing rooftop rainwater harvesting systems this year. And uh, it's really hard to predict what will people do if they run out of water. And these cities have population of, you know, five million or more each of the cities, and that's on the you know lowest scale. Some of them have 14 million, right? So it's so difficult uh, to even think about what will happen if we just run out of water. I guess for a time, the companies who are selling bottled water will do good business, but later <laughs> when you run out, it's really going to be chaos. And uh, do people realize that this has to do with the climate crisis or do they, co do they connect the problem? Uh, that's what civil society is trying to, uh, you know, make them understand. And fortunately, I would say that in the urban landscape, in, in the towns and cities, everybody does understand that the water crisis is related to the climate crisis. It is, in fact, the, the climate crisis for India. But in the villages, people just do not realize that. Uh, it's a poor country. And if if the poor people think that the water is going to earn them some money, they would sell their existing water sources for short-term gains. And that's a really a difficult thing because uh, that creates much and much more problems. Uh, you had some more pictures about the water situation. Uh, and actually, we don't have time, but we do have time for that. Uh, so uh, could you, you could maybe talk a little bit more about Okay, those pictures. I'll go back to the water Because I, I gave a sneak peek to your presentation, and uh, right. it, it uh, seemed very interesting. So one of the uh, things that the government is trying to address is the wastes of water. Th this is huge thing. As you can see, 40 to 50 percent of supplied water in India is lost due to leakage and dripping. And if that is addressed, uh, I think the the problem of cities running out of water by next year can be averted by a huge factor. Uh, I think at least for 10 years, 15 years, until we find a solution. Uh, the government of India also has taken up uh, greenering greening the riverbanks on a huge scale. And uh, if that happens, that's probably going to add to the, you know, a better environment, not just bring down temperatures locally in the towns and cities, but also, you know, uh, create the favorable conditions for, you know, uh, affecting rainfall patterns positively. The freshwater overuse, again, it's like one of the worst things that could happen. Well, we used to depend on uh, more on, uh, you know, uh, surface water in the past, but now we are more and more dependent on taking the water out from the aquifers, uh, which is, again, I think is one of the root causes of this problem. Uh, because the rivers are there, but uh, 
at least in where I live in the eastern part of India, but people are more and more dependent on supplied water. So what they are doing is depleting the aquifers more and more. And because we are cutting down the trees, the, the rate of, you know, the percolation of the water to the underground aquifers has really uh, gone down massively and which has really sent aquifers falling. I showed you one slide where uh, the water tables are falling by about 20 feet per year. So that is not just true in that state. In across India, where I live in Assam, uh, we now have to dig about 300 feet more than what we used to just 10 years ago. So that's really incredible. This is, of course, uh, Maharashtra, where the water crisis was. Yeah, so 20 feet per year. And that is not just true for Gujarat. It's true for Telangana, for Maharashtra, for Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. This actually is the worst affected belt in India. So this is like practically half of India, you know, in terms of population, in terms of uh, uh, even industries. This is, of course, the most industrialized part of India. And the next affected part is the northern belt. And incredibly, this northern belt actually gets most of the water from the Himalayan rivers. And uh, because of accelerated Himalayan melting, the rate of water flowing down the rivers is more. So during the rainfall months, we have massive floods. We have a lot of riverbank erosion. But when it does not rain, the rivers go dry. And there's a water crisis. Uh, that, that means that we are not able to hold on to our water sources. Uh, if I take the example of a city called Udaipur, which is located quite close to uh, Jaipur here, uh, the, the rulers of that state in the past had very, very carefully built huge reservoirs. And in the middle of the desert, you see this, all these wonderful cities in Rajasthan, and they're all dependent on the reservoirs. These are you know, man-made lakes. And uh, these cities have no water problem for the last 600 years. And that, I think, lies there lies a solution. If we can harvest the rainwater and create these huge uh, lakes and reserves near the urban areas, near the rural villages, and then I think uh, we will have a solution to the water crisis, at least in the short term. So you are positive about solve the problem in the short term? Yeah, positive that we can solve the problem. But as you say, we don't have time. The government has to wake up and act now. Uh, and a question for you, Guy. Uh, could you just tell us some more about what you two are doing here and the, t the train trip you're going to take tomorrow or tonight? tonight. Of course, yes. Um, it's our great privilege, really. One thing we wanted to take direction from you, Ingemar, on was to demonstrate to us and then to demonstrate to people in Europe that it's possible to go on a great adventure to really engage with the wilderness without flying. And so I joined uh, uh, Raj in o Oslo. Uh, we are quite enjoying ourselves, thank you very much. We came from Oslo by bus and train. We come out of train, uh, by train out of here today, and we go directly up to the Arctic to see my friend here. Um, that's really connecting again. It's also about uh, realizing that we are one Europe, we are one uh, species worldwide and that we are as responsible for the Arctic as we are for our back garden. Um, if I may borrow a moment, um, my, my education in wildlife goes back to Sir David Attenborough who was at the COP last year, the other half of the, uh, the duo with Greta. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, particularly in the UK, maybe Europe, maybe worldwide, it's very easy to think of wildlife issues as being somewhere else, yeah? But actually, right here in our own backyards, right there in your own back garden, right in your own street, there are species who are sharing your space with you. We outnumber them. There are 8 billion of us and ro roughly 8 million of them. So here's a quest for us. We have to find the one in 1,000 person to adopt one species. Okay. Alternatively, we can form a community of a thousand people and adopt one spe species. But the end result is, not, is much more than looking after wildlife. It's looking after the well-being of humanity. Because I honestly believe, and you can argue with me if you like, please do, 
if you woke up in the morning and there was no wildlife, it would be a very sad place to be. Okay. I agree. Uh, do we have a, Do we have any questions from the from the audience? Uh, I give you the m mic. I just wonder if you know the concept of Gaia, as, and uh, if you could develop a bit of that. The concept of Gaia is really interesting, and thank you because you're referencing a man who is almost my my mentor, although. Bless him, he's 99 now, okay? James Lovelock is 100 next year. I think some of you would like this kind of optimism. He invited friends of his last year for his 100th birthday party next year. <laughs> James Lovelock was uh, one of the old scientists who kind of understood a little bit about everything. I came across a technique, a technical technique, and it paid for his life. So he became a truly independent scientist. And he looked at the world in a way that nobody has ever done before, which was to see it like we were in an aquarium or a terrarium, yeah? all of us living here, all together. And all this carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen flying around, coming through us as living creatures and back out again in continuous cycles. And he said, OK, what would happen if we disturbed all that cycle? And his conclusion, his analysis, his prognosis for the future was terrible. And that was a long time ago, in the 80s. So now he tells everybody, come on, be calm, be quiet. We can only provide for the future. The past is the past. We're in the present. So let's get together and see what we can do to fix this problem. And here's my bottom line. Every single human being can have a contribution. It's my job, our job. We're just catalytic, yeah? I agree. To engage communities around the world to take responsibility as human beings. Thank you. Good inspirational background. Some more question? Yes. Uh, the other day there was this report from the UN that we're, we're going into maybe climate apartheid that the richer countries will always be able to buy their own food and, and water supply, but the poor countries, they cannot because they don't have the resources. What is your view on that? Because up here in the Nordic, we're still blessed, you know, with, with the rain, and last year we had drought, but we're not affected by what you're mentioning. So, Raj, could you please develop more on that issue because it's affecting millions of people. Yeah, that's what we worry about, actually, um, in the country. Even in within India, there are so many billionaires and millionaires, you know, and we feel they are the ruling elite now. You know, they make the decisions and they influence the elections. And it is not the voice of the people, although we are the world's democracy, our largest democracy. The voice of the people is not reflected in the actions that is being taken by the government. Just for example, we should have a water emergency now. We should have a climate emergency now. We should have a biodiversity emergency now. But we do not have any of those. It is really frightening that the, the, the lives of millions, and in the case of India, the lives of billions, could just be uh, laid, you know, nobody just care about them and just live, let them go to hell, right? Just let them, you know, be, uh, you know, what they are. Leave them to their fate and, you know, nobody cares. It is really frightening. And these people, uh, perhaps if, the, if they don't get the water, if they don't get the food, uh, they will rebel. And that is inevitable that there will be a kind of revolution, you know, that is probably what's coming. And frighteningly, uh, personally, I would want my family to, you know, probably get out of there. Uh, I don't see action happening in time. I'm not very optimistic uh, about, you know, what we are seeing in terms of real action to address these real issues. I'm sorry. Some more? Uh, uh, a follow-up question. Uh, you, you mentioned the election and the water wasn't an issue. Yeah. Uh, how, how do we get the climate and every crisis you mentioned to be the issue in next election in India and other places? Because it's all about the same in the whole world. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, a lot of us uh, in the civil society space are working on that. Uh, we have managed to get a lot of media attention in the recent past, and uh, we are doing uh, our best to uh, produce media content, write, uh, produce films, documentaries, and whatever we can to our best to engage the people. And uh, we also must mention that uh, uh, your own uh, lit, uh, girl, Greta Thunberg, has uh, for the first time ever mobilized students in the environmental movement in India. So we have seen, perhaps not on the scale that we see in Europe, but we have had thousands of students coming out on the streets. And in fact, uh, there was a very famous placard in India during the elections, which actually read, Abki Bar Climate Pe Sarkar, that's in Hindi, and which means that this time, let's elect a government on climate. And I shared that with uh, CCL, with Cathy Orlando, and she was so happy to see that. But uh, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We need millions of students, millions of citizens to come out and do the same thing. And we have seen that activism on the streets actually counts, and people, uh, the governments, uh, actually hear, listen to the view of the people out on the streets and take action. And I hope we'll be able to do that in the near future. Yeah, uh, we must. Uh, and I also think that we're going to do that, but we don't have time to wait, you know. Um, we have, uh, as we don't have time, we're, we're not on the street, we're on the internet and try to make change there and spread to the whole world. And actually, uh, a big follower group are actually from India. Uh, so we have, I think, uh, 200,000 followers from, from India, actually. Uh, so they are concerned citizens everywhere. And we also have a f uh, Fridays for Future India group now who are actively building up the movement. So. I I think we have uh, something to look forward to. Sure. So I I have to thank you and and you and good luck to the next train trip to the Arctic. And thank you all the audience for listening. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Thank you.